this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering six conversations from Season 3, Episodes 28 and 29, our preview episode and wrap-up panel from the 5th International Nash Day. This conversation starts with me asking each of the panelists to choose a single theme or event from the last 12 months we consider particularly critical, and then to share it with each other and you, our listeners. In this conversation, Stephen Harrison describes two related areas where we've made what he describes as, and I quote, real granular progress in drug development in terms of rethinking the design of late-stage clinical trials and the endpoint assessment related to this redesign. The fundamental concept here involves the entire structure of phase three trials. Historically, sponsors conducted a single, very large, very long trial that sought first to achieve conditional approval based on subpart H endpoints and fibrosis, and then to achieve full approval based on real outcomes developed as the initial trial group progressed through time, maybe cirrhosis. The new idea is to conduct the fibrosis and cirrhosis elements in parallel, thus shortening the time to approval, simplifying endpoints, and reducing the cost of the overall trial process. It's a vision of breathtaking scope, and, Stephen reports, it's just about ready to launch. It was an honor and privilege for Surfing Nash to be part of the biggest day on the fatty liver calendar. Both among ourselves and working with Jeff McIntyre, we got to explore a range of big issues. Yes, with a capital B for big and I for issues, we don't always talk about it on this podcast. We all had a great time doing it, and we hope you will have a great time listening to it. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn. And when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. Increasingly, if there's a holiday for Nash, it is International Nash Day. I think Global Liver Institute has done a really good job of making it a thing in its own right and an important thing. So in the sense that at the end of the year, it always makes sense to look back and say, okay, what's happened over the past year? I thought what the four of us would do today, given that this is the band, is each of us take one thing, one theme for what's happened over the past year that you think is of value or important and run with it. Three to five minutes, ideally, on opening statement and then comments and questions, and then we will go next. And Stephen... Uh, why don't you kick us off? Stephen Harrison. Sure. I mean, it, you know, I was thinking this morning a bit about the theme for today's podcast and what's different over the past year, what's changed, how have we advanced the field. And there's so many areas that in a lot of ways, there's so many things that I can look at to say is different today compared to a year ago. But in so many other ways, I feel like we're still in the genesis of a new galaxy forming. You can't really make out the solar system yet. You can't make out all the the planets and the moons. It's just kind of looks like a bunch of stars packed together. But when you drill down on it a little bit, I think where we've made some real granular progress is in drug development and understanding two things there. Number one, endpoint assessment, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then number two, the design of late stage clinical trials. And I'd I'd like to start there because, you know, I I don't think we've changed our early phase 2A or even 2B trials that much over the past year. You know, 2A, we're still accepting a non-invasive endpoint to generate safety and tolerability data and some early proof of concept efficacy data. We can build on that in phase 2B. We're still doing paired liver biopsy studies of two to 300 patients usually, multiple doses, placebo controlled, and we're incorporating non-invasive tests. But again, primary endpoint, generally histology, and generally it's still NASH resolution or one-stage improvement in fibrosis. However, I think Recently, there's been, a, I think, a pretty significant change in the way that we're approaching phase three clinical trials in NASH, and that is maybe worth expanding on. So if you think back to beta-colic acid and l so the Regenerate trial, the Resolve It trial, even early, early on, the studies with Gilead, the, the idea being there that you enroll your phase three registrational trial in two parts. First part is 1,000 to 1,200 patients 
that subpart that gets you subpart H approval. There's a finite histology endpoint at one year or year and a half. And but those patients don't stop. You keep following them for a period of four to seven years, and really you're looking for an outcome. And these are predefined outcomes, and you're looking for a certain number of them relative to placebo. So after you you get your subpart H, you still enroll another 800 to 1,000 patients. So your total cohort size is you know somewhere around 2,000 or just north of that. And again, these are F23 patients you're following to an outcome. And a beta colic acid is a great example of that. They read out their initial subpart H approval and close to 1,000 patients, presented that data. They saw 11% treatment effect delta in fibrosis. They then filed a new drug application. They awaited for the PDUFA date, and they, they received a complete response letter. It never stopped enrolling the trial. The trial still enrolled. It reached 2,000 patients or so, and many more patients have re- reached that subpart H biopsy, and then many more have continued. In fact, many patients have made it past the four-year time point, I believe, in follow-up. Elafibrinor was doing the same thing with Resolve It. Unfortunately, they didn't meet their uh, statistical significance on their primary endpoint with subpart H, so that study was was uh, halted. Now, fast forward to 2022, and you hear the announcement from Madrigal that after meeting with the FDA, there's been a bit of a pivot. So now, instead of enrolling one trial to get subpart H and then extending enrollment to gather long-term data on progression to an endpoint, there are now two parallel phase threes. There's the Phase three, which is enrolling NASH F23 patients that gets you subpart H approval. It's a one-year biopsy with dual primary. So you either have NASH resolution without worsening of fibrosis or fibrosis improvement by at least one stage without worsening of NASH. And there will be a yes-no decision based on a p-value of whether or not it looks like that drug might be approved, a new drug application potentially filed if if there is that hope, there is a positive p-value, and then it then we wait for the FDA. But the new part of this is starting a well-compensated serotic study that is considered a phase three trial where you enroll patients for the sole purpose of an outcome. The idea being you enroll seven to 800 of these patients with well-compensated F4 disease to placebo or drug, and you follow them over a two to three year period, again, looking for pre-specified endpoints. And when you reach that pre-specified number of events, the study's over. There are two things that make that attractive. And, and I think potentially change the game a little bit or change the the way that we look at enrolling these trials. We're potentially able to get to an outcome quicker because we're not waiting for an F2 or an F3 patient to march to progression to cirrhosis, which is the most common outcome. We're not waiting for them to develop ascites, overt hepatic encephalopathy, variceal bleeding, MELD score greater than 15, death or liver transplant. We're waiting for a cirrhotic population to get there. So the idea being you can get there quicker. But there's another benefit. We don't have to enroll more patients that have F23 disease beyond that subpart H approvable cohort. So you can essentially save on your enrollment in that subpart H approvable endpoint. You still have to enroll your 900,000 patients or whatnot, maybe more than that, but you don't have to enroll 2,000 in that cohort and then wait forever for somebody to progress. You get your subpart H endpoint at the same time you're enrolling patients in a WellComp F4 trial. We talked about this last year, but really it took a lot of effort in meeting with the FDA and partnering with the regulatory authorities to come up with this approach. And and it's good to see that now that is about to launch. And so when you do that, the other benefit to a trial like that is you you have increased alpha spend. There's an ability now to to take instead of NASH resolution without worsening of fibrosis, now you can bring up fibrosis improvement without worsening of NASH. It's not a co-primary. You don't have to hit both. 
It's a dual primary. It's an either or situation. And you have extra alpha spin because of the way that both trials are designed. So that I think is is one of the major things I've seen happen this year. And I know I went over my three to five minutes there, Roger, but I, I do want to spend a brief moment on endpoint assessment because I think that is something that's still evolving, but it seems to be picking up steam. We have a regulatory body who, by all accounts, is receptive to this notion of looking at modifying endpoints, and we're rapidly generating non-invasive data to help us address that. But in the intervening period, we're looking at ways to redefine our histology a bit. And that's really been pushed forward quickly because of the seminal work that one of the AI digital pathology companies did in connection with a large group of pathologists and hepatologists. And specifically, I'm talking about the Journal of Hepatology paper led by Beth Brunt and Quentin Anstey showing the difficulty in identifying balloon hepatocytes. And I think that's really catapulted everybody forward towards looking to something that we could use as an alternative for subpart H approval. I don't have the answer today on what that is, but I can just tell you there is a lot of movement to crystallize that assessment, this new endpoint. We don't know what that is yet, but I'm going to hearken back to the trial design I just mentioned, and that is at least from my foxhole, from my perspective, the ability to study well-compensated F4 patients is going to, I think, allow us to develop a non-invasive testing endpoint strategy in non-serotics much quicker. And why do I say that? Because we have the ability, I think, in this F4 population to enroll a percentage of patients non-invasively without a liver biopsy confirming NASH cirrhosis. Remember, this is an endpoint assessment, not a repeat liver biopsy assessment. So if we could enroll people non-invasively, let's say they have an MRE greater than five, we know that's cirrhosis and we don't need a biopsy then because we're looking at an endpoint. Did they develop ascites? Did they develop MELD score greater than 15? You know, did they develop decompensation, otherwise a transplant or death? That'll also help us understand how the non-invasive test behaves relative to that endpoint, right? So if you have an MRE of five and that patient those groups of people with MREs of five to six progressed an endpoint over two to three years at this rate of speed versus you enroll an MRE of seven or an MRE of eight at baseline and they progress at X rate of speed or Y rate of speed, you can begin to understand more about how an NIT links to an outcome. And once you show that in a well comp F4 population, I think we're going to have we're going to have the ability to then take that data learned back to the F2-3 population. And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We will be back next week to preview the 2022 International Liver Congress from Easel. Until then, stay safe and surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.